Jackal among snakes saw author, Nemorosus, chapter 121, Metal Clashing, with Garm's existence made known, the Lord of Copper had gained leverage over Argrave. That was an incontrovertible fact, with a word or two, Argrave could become an outlaw in most of the lands in the burnt desert. Fortunately, the significant delays in their travels had enabled Argrave to recover fully from his magic debt to Earl Abner. He could use the blessing of supersession again. What do you think we should do? Questioned Annalise. The three of them watched the vessels speak to Briam. This is an unenviable position. He has his hands wrapped around something vital. Argrave nodded. Then he looked to Annalise. But look at things this way. We skipped a step. What? Asked Gilliman. His trust. Argrave lowered his head, staring at the road before Cyprus. He thinks that he has power over us. And so he's more willing to implement us in his plans. He thinks? Repeated Annalise. He does have power over us. Perhaps we should make sure that Garm is safe. I don't think that Garm is in danger. Argrave shook his head. But if you judge differently, we can go back and make sure right now. Annalise sighed and crossed her arms. If only we still had our druidic bonds, we might confirm that without needing to move. We'll get new ones soon enough, Argrave assured. Perhaps quicker than I thought. One's better than that dragon ah. He's our friend, I suppose. Better than what Ro has. Dot what? She looked at him incredulously. In terms of utility, certainly. But for now, I say we go along with what Briam asks of us. Argrave turned to her. She looked very torn. But after a while, she gave a slow nod. All right, hash. Briam and his escort of four vessels stopped just before a plain grey building that was no more than a simple dome of cold stone. Argrave's party was off to the side, not fully integrated with the rest of the Lord of Copper's retinue. Before we enter, allow me to relay my expectations. Briam spoke to Argrave, though did not turn his head. This place is called simply the Stone. It is a neutral meeting ground for the vessels in this city. The place from which all of the lords of Sathia were born, mined from the stone, forged by Felhorn into metal, Argrave finished. I know. That's correct, Briam smiled and nodded. My distant ancestors were pagan lords, but Felhorn's coming changed that. What's expected of us? Argrave pressed. I don't suspect you will have cause to speak much, Briam confessed. Here is your role, you are mercenaries, hired by me. Your presence is meant to provoke them into action. Argrave nodded seriously then questioned, against the tribals, or, against me, Priam's smile faded, the other lords, they are constant, calm, just like the waters of Felhorn, the southern tribals have been belligerent for years, and yet not once have the lords retaliated, we vessels only enforce rules on our subjects, and you are not fond of that refusal to retaliate, Annalise noted, why are you different from them, they are all literalists, traditionalists, Priam said contemptuously, they plan to be but a vessel all of their lives, a stagnant pool, a still lake, growing only as rivers deposit their rainwater into them. Their power grows, certainly, but Felhorn is the god of rain and floods. The vessels alongside Briam nodded eagerly, his zealous followers drinking in his words. Annalise pointed to him. And you wish to become the flood? The southern tribals of the mountains have learned, grown, and adapted. Our current way nets us nothing. The literalist way, remaining as a stagnant pool, offering drink to those who submit, is insufficient to spread Felhorn's eternal rain further. Briam shook his head and clenched his fist genuinely aggrieved. I cannot see the faith stagnate like this. Even if I must be the one to stir the waters, they must begin to move. What is the benefit of provoking action against you? Gilliman questioned. When is wood weakest? Briam questioned, stepping up to Gilliman and staring up at him. When it is rotten inside, Gilliman stared unflinchingly. Your point? When will an enemy attack? Briam held his hands out. When their foe is at their weakest, and the southern tribals have been looking for an avenue to attack for many years now. Provocation after provocation, Argrave shook his head. You certainly have your work cut out for you. All of this just to lure the southern tribals down from the mountains? Seems far-fetched. Too many things left to chance, he baited, trying to get some information out of the talkative Lord of Copper. My people need to wake up to the realities. I am certain Felhorn will see fit to bestow upon me the luck I need. I am certain that the tribals will be ready. Briam smiled and shook his head. Now it's all but confirmed. Brim is working with some tribals. Even if it isn't Durin who's talking with them, if I can get contact with these tribals, I can make this flood hit a dam. Of course, he's not going to let me meet them easily. He'll hide their existence until the day of the attack. I see you're pleased, Brim noted, staring at Argrave. Argrave hadn't realized it, but he was smiling. He ran his hand across his face to suppress his expression, then said, Just feels like things are finally going my way for once. Long road ahead but I'm eager to trod it. I have some ideas to swing things in our favor evermore. But those can come at another time, certainly. Indeed, Briam nodded. What I've told you, I will soon tell those inside this building. I feared I might have to use the leash around your neck, but you convinced me I was mistaken. It matters not. I am glad of that, Argrave said simply. Now, the Lord's Argent and Aurum have been kept waiting for twenty minutes. I am positive they will be incensed. Briam stepped ahead into the stone. Hash.
The three lords of Sethia were each and all as remarkable as the copper-skinned Briam and matched their titles absolutely, embodying them in their appearance and dress. These appearances were not something coincidental. Each of the three had been tailored over generations to better fit their role, and to cement their status as the lord of their tower. Argrave knew how they maintained these appearances, breeding systems within their towers. People with desirable traits were hired to bear a vessel for the tower. They were technically free, but realistically forced to remain in the tower living luxuriously for the purpose of producing heirs with the desired physical traits. Now, these three lords sat at a table in the center of the stone, flanked by their own personal retinue of lesser vessels. Argrave felt out of place. He usually did, though. The three lords sat in a triangle on the circular table, neither facing the other fully. The Lord of Silver, Quarus, was a tall albino man. His skin, hair, and eyes lacked all pigment, making all of his features resplendently white. He had a sharp look about him and seemed to be angry constantly. He kept his hair long as though to show it off, and wore only silver jewelry and clothing. His status as a vessel seemed to preclude the usual vision defects associated with albinism. The Lord of Gold, Chryslia, was a woman with very strong elven features. Her skin was vaguely gold-like but lacked the intensity of the real metal and was further muted by the wet skin natural to the vessels. Her hair, though, was a perfect match for the word gold. On top of all that, she wore enough accessories of the precious metal to afford a king's ransom. Quarus leaned forward into the table, clenching his fists as he stared at Priam. We agreed to meet here with you out of respect for the long-standing title of the Lord of Copper, and of respect for the greatness that has come out of Cyprus in the distant past. Quarus slammed his fist and stood. But you insult Argent by bringing a mockery of our features? He pointed to Annalise. Argrave pulled her back and stepped forward almost instinctively, immediately on edge. Priam raised his hands up to pacify Quarus. You've misread me entirely. Quarus, he said pacifyingly, silver hair, pale skin, what else am I to make of this? Quarus shouted angrily, you would make one with the features of the Lord of Silver subordinate. They aren't subordinate, Priam said calmly, still holding his hands out. They're mercenaries. Above all, they're a fitting response to what happened to your tower. Quarus breathed heavily for a few moments, staring at Annalise. After a long time of tension, the Lord of Silver turned, picking up his chair that had been tossed to the ground in his outburst. He corrected it and sat. Still a ball of wrath, Chryslia, Lord of Gold, had been waiting for her time to interject, and did so now. Let us not forget the purpose of this meeting. Yesterday, you called a meeting between you and Quarus, for the purpose of, I understand why he brought us here. Now, Annalise whispered into Argrave's ear, drowning out Chryslia's voice. Ear tingling, he turned his head slightly at her voice while waiting for her to continue. To mark us as his, to bind us closer, eliminating our political mobility in the city. It would be all but impossible to cooperate with Argent or Aurum now. Argent views us as a public insult. Aurum would not risk offending Argent. Enlightened, Argrave directed his focus back to the conversation ahead. The Lord of Gold had finished summarizing the purpose of this meeting, remaining the calm mediator. What do you have to say for yourself, Briam? Quarus insisted, leaning in. The meeting. Briam began. It was a coincidence that it matched with the time of the raid. His words were met with a complete, almost incredulous silence throughout the stone. Quarus leaned back in his chair, face dot as he stared at Briam. Is it so surprising these things should happen? Briam raised his hand into the air. Every time the southern tribals raid, they receive very little retaliation. At the best of times, we send a party to demand back what was stolen. Retaliation is not the way of Felhorn. He rains only water, never blood. Chrysalia shook her head. All those living may still become a part of his eternal reign. Briam leaned in. Things cannot remain as they are. We must retaliate. We must flood those mountains they hide upon wiping them all clean. If we do this, we dirty our hands but once, and Felhorn's influence spreads to those damnable mountains once and for all. You verge on blasphemy, Quarus noted, his anger turning to alarm. This city was the first to be claimed by us vessels of Felhorn. Briam tapped the table. And now, we do not expand. Felhorn's reign remains constant, nothing more. We lose as much as we gain by the day. All of this, because we allow assist to persist. He's genuinely trying to persuade them, Argrave thought. A last-ditch effort to wake them up to follow his deluded fantasies of grandeur. Yet the two other lords were unmoved by the Lord of Copper's pleas, both staring at him coldly. Priam stood, becoming animate in his passion. We must march into the mountains, induct them into the faith. We have the capability. We have Felhorn at our backs. If he deems us unworthy, he will make his will known. Priam pleaded. But until we take the plunge, we remain as we are, constant, stagnant, core tenets of Felhorn's will. Both, Chryslia noted coldly. We came here with the impression this was merely the actions of a misguided young vessel. But the issue seems to be much deeper than that issue. There is nothing wrong with me, Briam said defeatedly as he lowered himself back into the chair. But you two refused to listen. And you did this as some attempt to wake us up? Quarus questioned. A ridiculous notion. I am done here. Quarus rose to his feet and made to leave. As am I, Chryslia agreed. Things must change, Priam. You are right. But not for the faith for you. 
She shook her head, then moved away. Briam was left as the last sitting at the circular table of the stone. Things had gone nearly exactly as he outlined, but Argrave thought he didn't look the least bit happy. It's time to get to work, before they decide to handle things, he said, rising to his feet. Chapter 122 Burdened we toil. Argrave returned with Briam to Cyprus alongside his escort of vessels. Once they were inside the first room, with its decrepit tapestry winding about the walls, the Lord of Copper spoke with a natural authority. The hunt is on. All know what to do, he said, and these words alone were enough to send the vessels beneath him scattering despite the vagary of the command. Argrave stood with his companions, waiting as the other vessels left the room. Priam walked to the couch they'd been received on and sat, lounging. Argrave stalked after him cautiously, waiting until there were none around to speak. Do you have something planned for me? Argrave questioned. Priam did not turn his head back to look at the three of them, and responded, Let me hear about these things that you have in mind. He set his feet on a stool. If all you offer is your status as a sea rank mage, and the prowess of your companions wouldn't dream of it, Argrave stepped around the couch, coming to stand before the Lord of Copper. I have deeper ties to this place than I let on, Argrave began. I had surmised as much, Briam nodded, against Urim and Argent both. Even if the southern tribals do indeed come. It's a pitched battle, to put it lightly. Briam ran his hand across his knee. How would you know this? You're saying I'm wrong? Argrave asked bluntly. Briam stared up at Argrave then fixed a piece of his wrinkled clothing. Let us continue as though you're correct, he conceded, refusing to admit his disadvantage. There are other regional powers, Argrave pointed to himself. I can make sure they support the right side. My side, naturally, Argrave thought. Briam furrowed his brows. What are you referring to? Well, barring the simple fact that the southern tribals are not as near unified as they let on. There are more than simply tribals in those mountains. He looked in the direction of the mountains, though nothing could be seen beyond the walls of Cyprus. Elaborate the Lord of Copper demanded. The Southron elves, for one, Argrave raised a finger, the dwellers of the caves, he raised another finger, and certain others, foreigners, like me, with whom I have a connection. You have ties with all of these? Briam questioned. I question if everyone in Sethia would be ignorant of you as they are, were that the case. If one has rope, they can tie a knot. Argrave waxed poetic. Briam smiled. You mean you can make these ties, and you would expect only the rope from me, I presume? Argrave shook his head. I have my own rope. Briam looked taken aback by this. I will warn you, I reward only results, he cautioned. Overpromising earns you naught but severed trust. If your reward results, I'll be one rich man, I think. Argrave smirked. Briam took a deep breath, obviously affected by Argrave's claims. He placed his hands on the couch and rose to his feet. My careless action at the stone has caused you some trouble. Your companion is perceived to be an insult to Argent. I may have put her in danger. Careless my ass, Argrave thought. He knew exactly what he was doing. Annalise is safe now and that's what's important, Argrave dismissed. The woman in question crossed her arms and nodded, agreeing, and she should stay safe. Briam looked at her. To that end, you will henceforth be accompanied by one of my own, a vessel by the name of Yara. You have met her. She retrieved you at your inn, Briam explained. She is extremely loyal to me, and her vessel is one of the larger in Cyprus. Indeed, in all of Sethia, she has absorbed the lifeblood of many transgressors. Most threats she can handle. Argrave pushed his tongue against his cheek, trying his best to hold back a frown. He said, you will. Not an offer, but a mandate. I suppose I should have expected something to link us to him yet further, he divulged a lot to us. Between Garm, threat of retaliation from Argent, and now this Yara. He won't trust us easily. That's fine by me, Argrave nodded, realizing displaying his reluctance earned him no favors. But some of these peoples I'll be contacting, they won't look at the presence of a vessel kindly. Getting them to agree to attack Sethia alongside southern tribals is a far cry from getting them to cooperate with followers of Felhorn. Priam walked to the tapestry on the walls, hands on his hips as he lost himself in thought. He turned his head back to them once he'd formed his answer. She will give you space at her discretion. If you are as valuable as you claim to be, though, it is paramount that she protects you at all times. We vessels need not sleep, eat, drink, and are unfatiguing. In summary, able protectors, Argent may strike at any time, already got a sleepless protector, thanks, Argrave wished to say, then we welcome the extra hand, Argrave instead said jovially, spreading his arms wide, I hope she is amenable to working with us, instead of merely protecting us, Briam huffed out a laugh, you must have gained an impression of her, she is quite brusque to all but me, he nodded, then walked back up to them, yes, I'll tell her to be cooperative, I'll tell her of your pet project, too, so worry not about exposing your head to her, she's away, doing some things for me. I will have her come to your inn. Expect her shortly. Argrave felt bitter with that reminder thrown into his face, but he suppressed those thoughts and nodded. Then I'll. What was it you said? Start the hunt, Argrave concluded. Hash. Argrave looked back at the pattern-covered Tower of Cyprus. Before we make it back to the inn and meet with Yara, we should talk. Thoroughly, Argrave said, 
turning around on the road and speaking to his companions. What is there to speak of? Despite unexpected occurrences, things have gone mostly as we predicted, Annalise pointed out. I'm unsure how the two of you perceive this whole plan of mine, Argrave admitted. You too. Value, honor, loyalty, contracts. He sighed. And here I am, entering into employment under someone with the intent to betray. I am contracted only to you, Gleman said at once. Any stain is on your soul, not mine. I believe Vade granted you this purpose you have. She would not choose one such as you in ignorance. Your personality is part of her expectations. As such, I have no qualms. She has ordained this to happen. Argrave nodded gratefully, never disappointed by Gleman's steadfastness. I am of a similar mind, Annalise confirmed in turn. Besides, there is no true agreement towards either of you, and I would not expect that man to be honorable in any dealings. She looked back towards Cyprus. Speaking personally, I trust you, she nodded with a smile, feeling affirmed and bolstered now that one of his doubts was squashed. He took a deep breath and exhaled. This faith you're showing. Enough to make a man weep, he said, only half joking. I'm glad we're all in agreement to ride down this river to the end. But now we have the biggest hindrance to any creative pursuit. Argrave looked between the two, but neither provided an answer. He spoke the next words grimly, saying, a supervisor, dot yet with the concession of freedom in our negotiations with regional powers, Glimmon pointed out, she is ineffectual, the Lord of Copper mostly assigned her to prevent our escape, I presume, and to spy, Argrave noted, that much should be obvious, but I've got a hunch about something, Argrave put his hands to his lips, thinking, I don't think Briam knows fully what Garm is, only that he exists, we should try and find out what, exactly, they know, the woman seemed tight-lipped, Annalise pointed out, it will be difficult to get information from her naturally. Maybe so, Argrave conceded. Putting all that talk aside, I'm going to be streamlining some of our plans. Brim might have ulterior motives behind Yara's protection, but we've got free labor. Glimmon should know best. Anyone working for me, I work them to the bone. And since Yara's got no bones, I'll work her till she drops. Argrave looked towards Saithia, a grin on his face. Hash. Argrave was fitting some of his spell books back into his backpack when a sharp knock echoed out into the room. It inspired deja vu, being near the same pitch and volume as the last time Yara had come to their room. As ever, Glimmon readied his axe and opened the door cautiously. The sharp-eyed and thin vessel stood waiting there. Glimmon did not need a prompt from Argrave to open the door wider this time, allowing Yara to walk in as she pleased. Perfect timing. Argrave said enthusiastically. He put the last three books inside of his backpack and cinched it shut. He lifted it up. Here, wear this he directed. Her gaze jumped between Argrave and the backpack he held. She made no move to take it from his hand. It's a backpack. You wear it on your back, he explained sarcastically. When she gave no response, he continued exasperatedly. Come now. Brim said you are unfatiguing. Certainly better than bone shouldered me at carrying a pack on your back. I'm a mage, not a warrior. Dot I cannot promise it will be undamaged should we fight anyone, she said, voice dead. Argrave suspected making her laugh with the hardest mortal feat. I am rather adept at avoiding fights, the ones I find myself in and quickly, I find, soon. I'm sure Brim and the rest of Cyprus will agree with this assessment. But for now, here, he dangled the backpack, arms growing tired. He is Lord Brim, she corrected, then took the backpack from Argrave's hands, throwing it over her shoulder. It had been made to accommodate Argrave, and so the straps were quite loose. She tightened them quietly. Excellent. I'm very proud of you, he nodded. Now, are those shoes made for walking? He looked down at her shoes. They were no more than red silken slippers. It seems not. I will manage. She disagreed. Right. Argrave looked around. Annalise and Gilliman had already readied everything. Garm was disguised as he usually was, the stake hidden by Gilliman's pack, and his head concealed by the elven vampire's giant helmet. Well, let's be off. He made for the door. Wait, she interrupted, and Argrave paused mid-step. What? He asked patiently. She stepped closer. I need to know where you intend to go. An underground graveyard, Argrave said plainly. For the South Ron elves, in their glory days, I make a habit of exploring elven tombs. It would seem, though, Glimmon did the last one, actually. So you are a necromancer, she half noted, half questioned. On the contrary, Argrave shook his head. I am a druid. Among other things, he conceded. Her gaze wandered to the helm on Gilliman's back, and then she looked back to Argrave. Why do you head to this graveyard? Druid things. Argrave shook his head. It's a pretty dangerous place. Haunted, ostensibly, but in actuality, it has an animal infestation. Dangerous how? Don't worry, you'll be fine, I'm sure, Priam. Uh, Lord Briam talked about his confidence in you. I'm sure you'll be able to handle them fine, Argrave repeated with a smile. Please don't avoid answering, she demanded, a fire of irritation finally bubbling in that dead voice of hers. We'll talk on the way, Argrave said, undaunted, and stepped out of the room, his gait light and unburdened. Chapter 123, 
Singers of the Broom, backpacking was a laborious thing. Argrave was coming to terms with its necessity, but he could not say that he was fond of carrying a pack on his back with the bare essentials while traveling across landscapes of varying types. Without healing magic to ease him of blisters and other things brought about by the journey, he would never have made it across the burnt desert. Between its dunes of sand and its rocky hills, it was not an easy place to traverse, even in winter. Now, though, Argrave found great pleasure in the hike they took. They traveled from Sethia to the distant mountains where the southern tribals made their home. The weather was pleasant, the desert was quite beautiful, and the wildlife, terrifying though it might be at times, invoked a dual sense of nostalgia and wonder. It helped that he had conned someone into carrying his pack for him. It's going to be dangerous to travel farther, Yara warned, who kept pace with Argrave. She seemed to have no trouble with the pack despite being as skinny as he was while half his size. It was the power of a magical body, he supposed. Because of the tribals? Argrave looked up to the dark mountains towering above. Me. We'll be fine, he waved dismissively. Not much farther anyway. She adjusted the pack with her eye hardly concealed, casting glances at Garma Topgillerman's pack. Despite her constant curiosity towards the head, she asked as many questions as a mute. Argrave had intended to find out what she knew but her stubborn silence made that difficult. They traveled along a dry riverbed. Though the valley around them evidenced water had once flown through this area, all water had dried, and the clay-like soil beneath their feet was hard and cracked into tiles of varying sizes. Argrave kept his eyes on the mountain as he walked slower, looking for landmarks he recalled from the game to guide him. After a long delay, Argrave spotted a strangely split rock that was quite familiar to him and smiled. Folks, let's set our packs aside. Some place safe. What for? Yara questioned while Gilliman and Annalise moved to obey immediately. Gilliman freed Garm from his position, holding him in his free hand like a torch. Argrave rubbed his hands together. Time to get to work, obviously. Yara followed Argrave's gaze to a large boulder down into a gulch. Seeing she still wasn't removing the pack, Argrave chided. You were so hesitant to put it on, now you can't bear to take it off? Just listen. Is that hard? She begrudgingly took the pack off and set it alongside Annalise and Gilliman's. After ensuring that their packs were well concealed, Argrave proceeded into the gulch minding his step as it descended slightly. The gulch turned right, driving further into the mountains, but Argrave ignored the turn and walked to the boulder. Argrave held his hand out and knocked four times, then said loudly, Jebica, blood of Burgund, has come to pay respects. He waited a few seconds. And then the giant boulder, which had been as solid as any other rock, turned to sand. It fell on him, and Argrave reeled away, coughing. He cleared sand out of his nose, his hair, his ears, and his mouth, then lamented, forgot about that bit. Argrave continued to spit out grains of sand ungracefully as the others near him stared beyond into the cave. Once he was done, he straightened and examined his own handiwork, a smile lining his face. Though the cave ahead was disorderly and uninviting, glowing blue runes shone on the surface of the cave wall. Oftentimes games, heroes of Berinder included, would have restrictions on quests. Even if the player knew the solution to a puzzle, they'd still need to talk to the right person to be able to proceed. That Argrave had been able to overcome this hurdle without doing so was a deeply satisfying thing, and it doubly confirmed that no one had come here before him. Care to lead, Yara? Argrave gestured ahead. By the look of her, Yara's answer was a resounding no. That said, she showed no hesitation in moving forward into the ominous cave. Glimmon followed just after, while Argrave and Annalise proceeded side by side. The narrow cave abounding with glowing blue runes was a wonderfully unnerving sight in person. The faint babbling of rushing water echoed out as they walked deeper. The runes provided light enough to walk forward without issue, though, and soon enough, the narrow entrance widened into something much grander. The narrow passage widened into a vast cavern. A set of stairs descended deeper down into the cave, meeting the smooth, upward-sloped cave floor. At the very top of this slope, there was a small spring, a single trickle traveling down in a straight line. This small trickle divided the cave into two sections, though the erosion was not especially significant. Coffins of black clay rose up along the sloped cave floor. They were packed closely together as they ascended, like stairs built for giants. The coffins had blue runes along their rims, lighting the place like torchlight. There was a neary mist about the whole area, dense, almost cloud-like. These runes are incomprehensible, Annalise muttered, gazing out in awe. And this place, so, don't get lost in your head, Annalise. I can tell you what I know about this place after we're done. In fact, Argrave turned his gaze to the vessel. Yara, you may wish to prepare to fight. Gulliman nodded, freeing his helmet from atop Garm's head and donning it himself. He drew his great sword, too. Argrave held out his hand, a spell matrix forming. Soon enough, four electric eels bounded from his palm, illuminating the area better yet as they drifted above his head. He took slow, steady steps down the wide stairs, waiting and watching the entire room. Their advance into the tomb seemed to evidence that no danger awaited them, yet the atmosphere of the place was decidedly not easing. The dense mist, the coffins, the constancy of the babbling stream above. Argrave's gaze flitted to a coffin. Deep within the complex system of caves, a noise rang out, wind chimes, 
Almost, it was pleasant to the ear. This chiming grew in volume, slowly melding together into something more complete. It formed a soothing melody, almost playful in tone. Be ready, he cautioned, and his words of caution proved to be of perfect timing. The mist within the cave began to condense, solidify, in but a second. Argrave found himself facing a black-skinned warrior with large ears and indiscernible features. A curved sword whistled towards his face. Argrave willed their, electric eels, to move and they struck their target far faster than his newly formed foe's sword could move. Their warrior staggered back, flesh cracking and leaking mist. A guttural and phlegmy howl battered against Targrave's ears at once, echoing in his head and against the cave walls until it was all he heard. The sound was terrifying enough that he felt all his skin crawl against his leather gear, despite that he had been fully expecting it to come. The pleasant song became discordant ringing. Yara was the first to regain her composure. Or perhaps she never lost it for her hand liquefied and thrust forth like a spear towards the warrior's head as soon as it ceased staggering. Its head scattered like the mist from which it was made, yet the attacking seemed ineffectual. It did not walk forward, it merely reformed forward, slicing at Yara's stomach. Glamin slashed at it with his great sword. His blow struck home, both the metal blade and the wind blade following it causing another visible impact. With another near-identical howl, the mist exploded backwards, blown by an invisible wind. The sight did not distract Targrave from the sound of something scraping, claws on stone, Argrave thought like a fleeing animal. Well, Argrave began, stepping forth. The first of them knows that we're here. It's like I told you, you can only hit them when they're trying to hit you. They have to be solid to attack, and as such, that's the only time they can be hurt. These must be wraiths. Ghosts, Yara said with conviction. This mist is not true mist. I cannot absorb it. Don't you listen? I told you they weren't. Argrave shook his head. Back in the day, the Southron elves used to reign supreme here. They had pets they used for war. And intrigue. Argrave looked about the cave. The singers of the Brum, they're called Brumasnas for short. They subsist on the souls of the dead. The little devils are no ordinary animals, and can be held responsible for the warrior we just dealt with. This fog. Argrave held his hand out. It's a magic mist. A Brum, I guess. They can travel through it, conjure distractions, conjure fighters. Yara seemed to be trying to find a hole in what Argrave said, but it seemed after some reflection, she simply nodded. Don't kill them, please, Argrave requested dryly. They're very valuable culturally and otherwise. Though, maybe you don't care about the cultural part. But how will we stop? Tire them out, Argrave explained. They expend their energy every time they try and stop us. It's a game of cat and mouse, chasing these creatures about till they drop. So we have to continue to fight these missed apparitions until they simply cease? Yara questioned. Precisely, Argrave nodded. There are plenty of other rooms in this place. So, let's get walking, and let's stay alert. Argrave took a step forward, and the mist solidified once again. A hand thrust out towards Argrave's neck, a dagger in hand. He raised his arm to block, trusting his armor's enchantments, but Annalise was ready. A single white bolt of, sky sunder, struck the hand, casting the arm aside. It dispersed and vanished. Should heed my own advice, sometimes, Argrave lowered his arm, then readied four more, electric eels. Thanks, Annalise. Someone else should lead, I think. Hash. It was not especially difficult to find the Brumasinas throughout the vast tomb. Though the rooms were many, each carved of a vast cave system, they needed only follow the mist, seeking out its intensity. The Brumasinas conjured the remnants of the spirits they had consumed, namely, Southron elf warriors. Vigilance alone proved enough to combat the majority of their conjured warriors. Fortunately, Argrave worked Yara tirelessly, making her take the lead at all times. The creatures weren't stupid, though, and they were pack animals. They quickly gathered together combining their efforts against the party. Cornering them was impossible. The Brumasinas could travel through the Brum they conjured, that was much of the reason Argrave sought them out. In time, they'd make great scouts. Soon enough, their party of four, five, including Garm, found themselves facing something quite unideal. Ahead, the mist was so thick that trying to see the room beyond was like trying to see through milk. The room had no other exits, so far as Argrave knew, but the fact remained that they had bunched up. Little bastards have been running for quite a while. Argrave kneeled down clicking his tongue, hard to get a notion of how many there are, too. Place ahead is like a death trap, Glamon noted. The creatures don't attack immediately. When we're in that mist, it's hard to see. And four, five of the attacks coming at once isn't manageable. Why not make use of that head on a stake of yours? Yara suggested. I question why you brought it. Argrave looked towards her. What, do you think it can warn us if it sees something? He pressed, finally seizing the opportunity to learn what she knew. I know it can, she shot back. And how? Argrave questioned. Because Briam told me, she said. He would not disclose that without conviction. So, Briam knows Garm can speak. Argrave tried to ponder what that meant of the situation, but he couldn't really narrow things down as to how Garm was ousted. I don't think that's necessary, Argrave said, pushing past that and focusing on the task on hand. We'll just need a good, steady formation. Argrave scratched his chin. Dot and some patience. Chapter 124
death in Toto. Argrave was the farthest thing from a hunter, but the people with him both hailed from a northern island where hunts made up a large portion of the food supply. Gulliman had been a part of many hunts, and Annalise knew much of the process by virtue of her sheer curiosity. As such, Argrave had learned that their people took two approaches to hunting animals in Veiden, trapping, or cornering. They could not afford to make any traps, and so they had worked at cornering the Brumasinas. Gulliman had steered them towards that end. Now, the creatures lay beyond a veil of mist, entrenched deeply. As the saying went, a cornered rat will bite the cat. Patience was their largest virtue. Their venture to capture the Brumasinas became a siege. The four of them would press into the mist, never enough to leave them vulnerable from all sides, but far enough to evoke a reaction from the animals hiding within. And indeed, time and time again, their warriors of mist would appear, and their party's patient caution proved more than enough to receive all comers. Brim's vessel, Yara, proved to be well worth the trust bestowed in her by the Lord of Copper. Once she learned how these warriors summoned by the Brumasinas functioned, she was quite adept at dealing with them. Her control over the water springing from within was masterful, to the point where she left not a drop behind no matter how she attacked. She seemed to have a penchant for manipulating the water within herself to weapons. She would reform her hands into swords, spears, and all manner of war instruments. This process took an uncomfortably long time. Argrave felt tempted to leave and ensure their backpacks left outside were truly hidden, but he kept those thoughts inside. Over the course of many fatiguing hours, during which Argrave ran out of magic, the fog that had been near as thick as milk began to dwindle. The place started to look like a graveyard sauna. At a point, their warriors conjured lacked form and distinguishing features, it had been obvious they were Southron elves, at first, and their skin had looked truly real. Now, they truly fought warriors born of mist. With a retreating slash of Gilliman's great sword, the last two remaining warriors finally dispelled not into mist, but into nothingness. Argrave had grown well used to their unnatural and grim howls, yet this last death knell did not echo out across the ancient tomb. The silence that followed was all-consuming. Who? Argrave breathed out. Some of his tension dissolved in the wake of excitement. The process of getting to the Brumasinas in the game was much the same, though admittedly infinitely more reckless and far less time-consuming. All right, Yara, Gilliman. Stay near the entrance. Make sure the little ones don't scamper out. Yara nodded, far more amenable to direction after the non-stop conditioning of the misty siege. With the two of them standing near the entrance, waiting, Argrave and Annalise advanced ahead. The room her coffins lined up on each of its two walls, but in the back of the room, stairs rose up to an elevated portion that housed one single, grander coffin. Argrave stepped around, watching the floors for any movement. Neither he nor Annalise spotted anything for a long time, but then he heard a faint, rapid sound. It sounded like a dog's squeaky chew toy, almost. It took him a bit to place it. But then he knelt down, lowering his face to the ground and peering beneath one of the coffins. At once, he smiled in triumph. He saw the Brumasinas he'd been seeking crouched low beneath the coffins. The white-furred creatures were canids. Their appearance bore the most resemblance to that of a fox, with especially large ears. Considering they were desert creatures, the fennec fox seemed a close relative. Their fur was like snow. Their eyes, too, were especially striking. They were like moving pools of gold a glimpse into another dimension. The Brumasinas were wheezing in exhaustion, all of their energy spent. Argrave lifted his head up and beckoned Annalise over. She came to the other side, and her presence made the creatures sidle away in panic, moving closer to the center of the coffin. Aren't they neat? He spoke to Annalise. Had we found them earlier, they would have been as black as night. Their fur changes color as they consume the souls of the dead, white, gray, to black. They are fascinating, she agreed. White hair scattered everywhere on the stone as she pressed her face to peer under. What should we do now? I count. 4. Argrave Kunkel. Chapter 125. Beast's Instinct. The vessel, Yara, placed her bare hand in the spring inside the cave. Argrave stood just behind her, watching this act with some degree of curiosity. They had retrieved their backpacks from outside. His Brumasinas were off in the cave, eating some of the still lingering souls in this place. The fox-like little creatures actually ate with their eyes, not nearly as disgusting as it sounded. Actually, their gaze alone could devour souls that lacked attachment. The water in the spring branched off at several portions, flowing into separate streams that slid in and out of the rocks, carving into the stone. Once Yara's hand met the water's surface, though, the constant flow started to cease. The streams which had been flowing downhill started to reverse, crawling back up the stone to swell the spring. As the spring swelled with returning water, the direction of its flow started to change. The water began to course towards the vessel's hand as though it was a hole beneath rather than a hand above. Despite the intense movement, once it met Yara's hand, it simply ceased. In a time no longer than a minute, the great spring quickly became a place of dry rock. Even when drained by a hose, the rock would never look this dry. Every bit of water became part of Yara, the vessel of Felhorn. It was a deep spring, she finally said, rising to her feet. Further portions will flow until they meet their end, but no more water will emerge. This visit proved to be of great value to Felhorn and Cypress both. I'm glad, Argrave said, 
lying. His triumph at gaining the Brumasinas was tempered by guilt. Perhaps he had been naive to expect that Yara would do nothing about a spring in this cave. But the guilt didn't bog him down, it was a reminder to work harder until the time came to turn Sethia to chaos. Argrave cast a supplementary spell of, pack leader, and the Brumasinas quickly scampered across the room, crawling up his leg and taking refuge in his duster. The creatures were light and small, something adapted for the desert, no doubt, and Argrave did not feel especially burdened by their presence. Argrave pet one of them, then lifted his head and muttered to Annalise, never pictured me as the pocket dog type of guy. Pocket dog? She repeated, explain it another time. Argrave dismissed, Yara, a question for you. She waited expectantly, staring up at Argrave. How much time do you suppose we have before the Lords of Silver and Gold decide to make their move? Lord Briam estimated, at shortest, a week. Other estimates are wildly varied, but the average of these predictions is about half a month, she explained, arms crossed. Argrave frowned. Bis generous, no? Yara shook her head. If Orem and Argent were so quick to plan an assault against Cyprus, one of three of the Lords of Sethia existing for hundreds of years, then this city would never have survived as long as it has. Order and deliberateness are the prime things to expect from the other lords. All right, Argrave raised his hands, conceding. But the day is nearly done, and I don't fancy walking around a mountain at night. We'll camp here tonight. Tomorrow, I have to earn the favor of the Southron elves. The vessel no longer held contempt towards Argrave, it seemed, for Yarrow expressed neither disdain nor anticipation regarding his grandiose comments. Instead, she asked, how do your ties to this land run so deep? Argrave smiled. Been here more times than you know. That answer only spawns yet more questions, she noted, eyes narrowed. I've got a lot of depth. Argrave spread his arms out, briefly revealing one of the Brumasinas before it sought cover once more. I'm going to set up my place to sleep, been an exhausting day. Argrave walked away, but then paused, turning and pointing to Yara. Do you think you could watch the cave entrance, keep guard? If any tribals see it, they'll notice the new cave and be upon us during the night. The three of us, we need to sleep. But you. Argrave trailed off. She stared up at him for a long while, and then slowly nodded. I'll keep watch. That's good. You're quite reliable. I see why Briam chose you. He flattered. She said nothing, then turned, leaving the correction, Lord Briam. Argrave bit his lip as she walked away, questioning if his repeated mistaken address might bring his loyalty to question. He shook his head and turned. He waited a suitably long time and then muttered, finally, some time to breathe. Annalise held her brumacinger in her hands gently patting its giant ears. It was a tiring day, she confessed. And another one tomorrow, Argrave continued. Hell, tomorrow might be the most important day of all. True, said Gilliman. Argrave looked back to the entrance that Yara had left from. Though Gilliman shook his head, confirming she was no longer there, Argrave's paranoia was not sated. He conjured a ward around them to be sure that she truly could not listen. You can talk now, Garm, Argrave said. Gods, what have I to say? Garm complained at once. It baffles me how you people manage to reveal me so easily. And who ends up suffering? Didn't exactly hear any genius ideas about how to hide your presence, Argrave rebutted at once, then sighed. No, that's not fair. But hell, I'm just as confused as you. The only times we were lax at all were on the roads. It's no matter, I have little to say, regardless. Garm closed his eyes. Get your talking in now, I'd advise, Argrave said. Despite that, Garm said nothing more. If you've nothing, as it stands, the South Ron Elves are going to be our linchpin for this entire thing, Argrave outlined. They're going to be our contact between us and Drun and they're going to be the primary coordinator for this entire little betrayal of ours. As such, it's very important that Yara stays far, far away from any inkling of association with them. You've said this enough, Gleman said. But now we've had a day with the vessel, Argrave explained with his hands. And we know better what we can do to stop any unfortunate occurrences. After how easily Garm was discovered, we have to be extra, extra cautious. I can agree with that, Annalise nodded. Her brumacinger let out a whimper and shook so she knelt and let it to the ground. As such, any conversation about plans that I have with the South Ron Elves, I want it to be underneath a ward. Argrave looked around. I'm telling you so that the both of you can know how to direct the conversation. Gleman shook his head. I'll just stay quiet. You two work well enough as a pair. You might not have that luxury. Argrave turned his head. The South Ron Elves respect warriors, not mages. Gleman sighed. I'm no orator, but I'll do what I can. With a nod, Argrave concluded. That's all I can ask. Hash. He's dead? Elias asked, not fully able to believe it. There can be no doubt, Helmut confirmed, purple-eyed gaze staring at Elias with some measure of remorse. Elias leaned back into his carriage's seat, bringing his hand to his face. His uncle, Bruno of Parban, had been slain. He felt a deep pit of emptiness within, like something had been torn out within him. Bruno of Parban, Elias' uncle. The first real loss in this war, he had been the impetus of their rebellion, ostensibly though his capture was merely the straw that broke the camel's back. His father had been so certain that the king would not dare harm him, yet now, without trial, without any attempt to transom, his uncle had been slaughtered. Sorry about your uncle, 
Stain spoke quietly, sitting across from Elias on the carriage. Elias didn't know what to say to that. No. He didn't want to say anything at all. He felt like the carriage he was in was far too compact and reached for the carriage door. It opened, the carriage still moving, and Elias alighted. Young Lord. Helmut called out, moving after Elias. Stain, too, jumped out. I just want to walk for a bit, he said, stepping ahead quickly. Stain and Helmut shared a glance, and then pursued the young Lord of House Parban, a fair distance behind so as not to disturb his thoughts. Elias kept pace with the horses pulling the carriage walking very quickly. Their escort of knights was much grander than even the one they had taken to Jast, and many of the knights looked to Elias, pityingly. Evidently, the young lord was the last to receive the news. Elias could only watch the ground for the longest time. His mind whirling. It gave him an unfailing sense of dread. But then he grew angry at himself. This was the reality of war. People died. He should not be so shaken simply because his uncle had died. With that bitter thought, Elias lifted his head, staring far ahead down the road. In the far distance, where the ground sunk into the earth, he saw the walls of El Brill. Walls were meant to evoke a sense of safety, protection. Elias always thought, the Lion's Gate just beside the Lion's Sun Castle had always brought a sense of wonder and safety to his chest. Now, though, with death on his mind, he felt a sense of danger, of entrapment. He was tempted to write it off as the idiotic thoughts brought about by recent grief, but he paused in the road. Young Lord. Helmut spoke, saying nothing more beyond that. Any bitterness or hostility that had come between them had just had dissipated in this moment. The only danger in war isn't sword and shield, Elias said, staring at Al Brill. It's true, Helmut agreed. Most snakes kill with poison, not fang and claw. And we're about to enter El Brill, to help him suppress this matter regarding unrest. Elias turned his head. I knew that I could expect to encounter some enemies here. Now my gut's screaming at me to turn around and go home. To safety. Never had a stronger feeling than this. No shame in that commented Stain. Instinct can save you. Bravery is proceeding in spite of fear. Elias shook his head. But, I have to remember my uncle. I must be cautious to the point of paranoia. Not for my life. But for those beneath me. He turned his head to Helmut. Tell the men that we won't go to Elbrail today. We'll camp out here today. Elias moved back to his carriage, climbing inside. Stain looked to Helmut, a question in his gaze, but the old wizard merely nodded and moved to obey. Chapter 126 Sleeping Oasis. Come morning, Argrave had fully repaid the small debt he'd accrued to Earl Abner, enabling his use of the blessing of supersession once again. Their route to navigating the obstacles ahead was much clearer after a lengthy discussion. And, lastly, the Brumasoners spent the night gorging, turning their fur from a snow-white to an off-white. The Brumasoners were magic creatures and had been living here for years, feasting on the high-quality souls of the dead Southron elves in this tomb. It would be some time before they'd be able to conjure warriors of mist or traverse through the fog to reach any place imaginable. In time, the five-pound furballs would eventually become true forces of nature, especially if our grave gave them good souls to eat. Dot, so these runes are illusion magic? Annalise questioned, sitting cross-legged beside one of the coffins with runes across its lid. Yep. Between the sand door outside and the runes throughout this place, it's clear the Southron elves were masters of illusion magic. Southron elf illusions, no matter if you're re-rank or S-rank can't be seen through. But. They're a lot more limited, Argrave explained, rubbing his finger across the glowing blue rune. She nodded, staring. Dot you didn't sleep at all last night. She said quietly, changing the subject. Couple hours, maybe. Not an unusual occurrence, Argrave dismissed, standing. What can I do, Gray? She also came to her feet. You can talk about it, she offered. What are you, my therapist? Argrave shook his head with a grin. We've got stuff to do. Let's go meet with Yara, rendezvous with the South Ron Elves. I just worry, she shook her head. Your habits were improving after we left the low way. Now. She sighed defeatedly. Now I question if you sleep worse. If you were sick again, I might heal you. This, though, I can do nothing but talk. Argrave bit his lip. He knew she was right, but that was only because he wasn't blind to his own condition. He stepped forward. You know, they say if you improve your physical health, your mental health will improve in turn. All the more reason to hurry towards becoming black-blooded. She smiled bitterly and nodded. As you say, let us go. Hash. Are you sure that you're headed the right way? Asked Yara, some of her confidence in Argrave diminished overnight. Yes, confirmed Argrave brusquely, holding his compass in hand. Certain enough to stake your life? She questioned. The three of you ran out of food, and there is only wasteland ahead. The four ambulatory people in Argrave's party trod across the dunes of the burnt desert. The town of Sethia had long faded behind the hills of distant black sand, and the only landmark still in sight was the tall, tall mountains. I'm certain, Argrave confirmed coming to a stop and glancing around before turning back to his compass. One of the Brumasiners poked its head out just by his neck, glancing around the vast expanse of black desert excitedly before retreating back into cover. How? She questioned, stopping beside Argrave, 
Her backpack, technically Argrave's backpack, swaying briefly before settling. Eidetic memory, he said, unfocused. What is that? She shook her head confusedly. Photograph. Well, no, that wouldn't make sense to you either. Doesn't matter. Was a joke, anyhow. Argrave shut the compass. Should be around. Somewhere. His gaze scanned the distant mountains. After a time, he stopped scanning and his face lit up. Aha, I've still got it. Argrave walked forward again, unburdened and certain. They passed over the top of another dune, and just beyond, there was a relatively flat bit of sand. Almost perfect in the center of this flat plain, there was a sword overturned and partially buried. The blade of the sword had curved barbs and was quite badly rusted. With quick steps, Argrave headed downhill towards the center of the flat bit of sand. He walked to the sword, and then picked it up, stabbing it into the ground. On the first try, it fell back into the sand. The second time, Argrave used more force, and it stood upright in the sand as he walked away. All right. Argrave took a breath. He held his hand out, and then used water magic. A steady pour of water flowed from his hand. What are you doing? Yara asked at once, angrily. Keep your hat on, Argrave said dismissively. I'm taking us to the South Ron Elves. He turned his head to look at her. Well, us, actually. As agreed, you'll stay outside. Argrave was, ostensibly, revealing the location of the South Ron Elves. They were a nomadic people by this point, though, moving from abandoned settlement to abandoned settlement. Argrave would be sure that, even if things did go sour, the elves would never be discovered. All he needed now was to keep Yara far from them. She stared at the water, not meeting his gaze. Felhorn permits violence against those that would conjure water with magic. Argrave kept his gaze steady. Permitting isn't encouraging, you know, he noted as the pool of water grew larger and larger, sinking into the sand and spreading out. You encroach on his domain, she pressed angrily, with a clench of his fist. The downpour stopped. Are you going to stop me from doing what I need to do to help Cyprus? I am a vessel of Felhorn before a servant of the Lord of Copper. Argrave took a deep breath. Part of him would be happy to be rid of this woman. They were alone, miles from Sethia, miles from any witnesses. And the woman was far too inhuman to warrant any remorse. All of the vessels were, but it couldn't happen. Argrave had to stay close with Brim until the time came to separate cleanly and completely. No nonsensical excuse would repair the trust severed by his best vessel's death. It would be a stupid thing to do and for the sake of ego instead of logic. And what do you think Brim would do, were he standing here? Argrave questioned, eyes narrowed. At that, Yara looked away at once, almost visibly recoiling. Argrave held his hand out and resumed his task, growing the pool larger and larger. Once that was done, he removed his glove. What are you doing? Questioned Gilliman. We need blood, don't W? Oh. Argrave paused. I forgot. Argrave put his glove back on. Gilliman stepped forward, retrieving one of his flasks. He removed the lid, then dropped the remainder of the blood inside it. Nothing odd seemed to happen to the pool of water. Its mundanity was enough that Argrave questioned if he was forgetting something. Don't forget, Yara. Stay here, out of sight, preferably. We'll be back. And when we are, the Southron elves will fight at our side when the time comes. We'll see, she said. Argrave took a step forward, towards the pool. Though his body had expected his feet to meet solid, if mushy, ground. It felt like there was nothing but air beneath them. Argrave fell into the water with nary a splash. Gilliman counted to three, and then stepped just after him. Annalise came last. Yara peered into the water, shocked. She looked as though she wanted to kneel down and touch it, yet she did not. Had she been more attentive, Yara might have noticed a set of golden eyes watching her. A single, off-white brumessinger crouched low atop a sand dune, watching the vessel with sublime patience. Its actions were far different from that of an animal. Hash. Having fallen to the ground, Argrave rose to darkness. His gloved hand brushed against something hard, a sandy stone, by his estimation. It took him a second to think to conjure a bit of spell light, and at once, the subterranean cave became lit up with light. The cave was made of black sandstone, a rather eerie sight, like some cavern of hell, but this place was precisely where Argrave intended to be. Glamon joined Argrave, very nearly landing atop him. His quick reflexes spared them both that. The elven vampire growled, move, and Argrave hasted to obey. Soon enough, Annalise joined them and Argrave supported her so that she wouldn't fall as he had. After she gave a thanks, Argrave questioned, Is it working? Dot it is, she confirmed. I can see Yara. Argrave sighed in relief. That's good. We can keep an eye on her, make sure she doesn't try anything. He turned his head round, examining the cave. Recalling his experience yesterday, he questioned, Annalise, and? You're not overwhelmed by feelings of death? Not overwhelmed, she said, emphasis implying that she was merely whelmed. And the feeling is fading fast. Okay. Do you think we can move? Dot I cannot, not while maintaining the druidic link, she admitted, not without guidance. Okay. Argrave stepped up, then said, gonna grab your shoulders, guide you along. After she nodded in confirmation, Argrave wrapped his arm around her and moved her along as he walked in the cavern. Fortunately, 
The place was spacious enough that they did not need to duck or maneuver significantly. The sandstone was flat and lacked treacherous obstacles, so the task was not excessively difficult, gods. Muttered Garm from atop Gilliman's backpack, just ahead, something more to complain about? Argrave questioned. Oh, nothing, Garm said sarcastically, just wishing I was blind. What does that mean? Please, don't distract me, both of you, Annalise interrupted before Garm could give his answer. The both of them heeded Annalise's word, and they trekked through the sandstone cave in silence. They trekked a long, long way, Argrave's spell illuminating the path ahead. Occasionally, holes of light poked through the cavern, the surface was not too far above, piles of sand evidenced that they were still in the dunes. Eventually, though, the flat ground started to go upwards. Wait, Annalise stopped them. What is it? The link is stretched quite thin. Annalise said, if I go further, I fear it will sever. I think you two should go on ahead. If Yara does anything, I will come and find you. Sure about that? Argrave double-checked. The exit's pretty close. Indeed, she nodded, and if the exit is close, all the better. With a nod of surrender, Argrave released Annalise and pressed on with Gilliman, casting glances behind him to be sure nothing would go wrong. Eventually, sunlight started to rear its head more and more, and the cave opened up into a very different sight, grassland. The grass stretched for a great distance ahead. It all led up to a great body of crystal blue water, utterly still and clear and pure. This oasis was flanked by many of the palm trees that they had seen back in Delphasium, with black trunks and purple leaves and strange fruits. The land was vibrant, full of life a far cry from the desolate wasteland outside. And just beyond the oasis, one could make out houses carved into the stone, with glowing blue runes carved into the paved walkways. Though suppressed by sunlight, those were sure to light up the place at night sufficiently. Place is big, noted Gilliman, kneeling. Not many people, though. Sixty, seventy, some are out, maybe, Argrave thought aloud. But this is it. The last bastion of the Southron elves. Seems it's just us three. Might as well say us two. I know you expect me to keep my mouth shut, Garm said bitterly. You can talk if you want. Argrave shook his head. Southron elves don't mind necromancy all too much. Their warp it set souls, after all. Nonetheless, you like to keep your cards close. Garm finished. I'll stay quiet. Argrave sighed. Thanks, Garm. Let's hope we don't have another stone apatal sentinels situation on hand. Chapter 127. Jet Black Relics. Wanted to say. Gulliman looked at Argrave as they watched the oasis town, far out of sight. You've gotten tougher. The hell does that mean? Argrave asked worried at Gilliman's praise. Gulliman shook his head as though telling Argrave to calm down. You used to never stop complaining. Couldn't bear the sight of blood. Hated physical work. Different, now. Not my choice, believe me. Argrave turned his head away. I like soft hands. Regardless. You're blind to yourself. At times, Gulliman finished. You're still making potions and poisons next time we need them. Argrave pointed at Gilliman without looking. Dot as ever. Gulliman said with a sigh. Enough talk. Argrave and Gilliman proceeded openly and honestly into the oasis town of the Southron Elves. It would be difficult to approach any other way with both of them being over seven feet tall, and they also didn't come for deceit and trickery. Of late, that was a rare thing. Just a reminder. Gulliman began seriously, and Argrave turned his head to look at the elf. Dot don't use the blackguard name, he advised. Argrave laughed once. Hadn't planned on it. I've been with you too long, the big elf noted, looking around the town. People were starting to take notice of them and anxiously moved to act. Tired of me? Argrave kept his gaze facing forward, keeping an eye on developments. He shook his head. Used to you. Argrave spotted familiar people and kept his eye on them. So what's the problem? Didn't blink an eye at jumping into a pool of water and blood to enter a cave with a dying race within. It's concerning, that's all. Gulliman tapped Argrave's elbow. Keep your hands up. Demonstrate we're harmless. Argrave obeyed Gulliman's command, keeping his hands in the air. I just broke one of their illusion spells, though. That's not the least crazy thing I've done, I'll admit. Maybe you can help convince Garm that I'm as all-knowing as I claim to be. He's seen enough. If he isn't convinced, my words won't change him, Gulliman answered. Argrave saw Garm's eyes move around in the helmet on Gulliman's back, and then squeeze shut. A great many of the Southron elves moved around the oasis, weapons in hand as they moved to confront the two intruders upon their territory. As they came closer, Argrave saw their features clearer. The Southron elves were far distinct from the pale skinned Vaidamon. They deviated far from their ancestors, enough so it was near impossible to think Gilliman or Annalise might be distant relatives to those present. Most notable was their jet black skin, far darker than that of the southern tribals or other denizens of the desert. Their hair, their nails, and even their eyes were black. Their ears were much larger, and their bone structure was altogether sharper. The Southron elves were a lean and skinny people, and a little taller than the humans our grave had seen in the burnt desert, a couple inches, perhaps but not to the extremes of the Vaidiamon. They wore elegant silk clothing matching in color with their skin. These elves gathered in front of Argrave and Gilliman, most pointing a large clay eye towards them. They shouted and cried and made demands, 
but their voices were too many to follow any sort of direction. Argrave took an uneasy step back, and then called out, we aren't here to cause any trouble. But his words were drowned out by a multitude of questions, and the glaives in the elves' hands did not lower, at the very least. The conflict was not escalating. Argrave was content to wait until things settled enough for him to speak, but then he spotted someone he knew quite well walking out towards them. All of you, let me pass. A loud voice rose above the rest. A grizzled veteran pushed past the crowd, face marred by scars and burns. Half of his nose had been torn off by something, and one of his eyes was blinded by a burn. Even still, he looked no less of a warrior as he pushed through the crowd, using his own clay eye as a walking staff that he did not seem to need. He came to stand a cautious distance away from the two of them. With silence reigning, Argrave pressed the advantage, using his classic trick, knowing everybody's name. You're the warrior Quentin? Argrave pointed. Quentin shifted on his feet, planting his clay eye in the ground. I mean, can't picture anyone else matching your description. Argrave pressed, lowering his hand. Quentin pointed with his clay eye. Who told you this? How did you get here? Jebica, of the line of Burgund, Argrave disclosed. Though the hostility from the Southron elves did not evaporate, it did diminish into a steady caution in the silence following. The Brumasners hiding in his clothes came out at this moment, and the sight of their long dead orbits evoked gasps of silence and mutterings from the crowd. Jebica, is that right? Contin said. And what did she say about me? She said. Argrave paused, rubbing his chin. Well, she said that you're a real asshole, honestly. Contin laughed. And Jebica? Why is she not here? Because she's dead, Argrave said simply. He picked up one of the Brumasners off his shoulder holding it in his hand and petting it. Quentin stared at Argrave. Then it seems you have a reason to be here. Hash. Quentin entered into a large room, seemingly emerging from nothing but the wall. He looked about, and then went to retrieve something. After rummaging through a bag in the corner of the room, he pulled free a black cube, etched with glowing runes like those found everywhere throughout the village. These runes did not glow blue, though, theirs was a fell purple. Dad? Came a voice. Quentin turned around. Don't leave the room, Ilchuda. I won't, the woman responded. A rather muscular Southron elf with a long, braided ponytail. She wore heavy coverings, likely for dealing with the heat of a forge. But what's the matter, that? She looked at the cube in his hand. Has danger come to the village? I don't know, Quentin answered. Not overt danger. Not an attack. But the vessels taught us those might be the biggest threats. Then, she pressed. Someone claiming to know Jebico has come. Someone else? She raised her brows. Yes, Quentin nodded. Ilchud removed the thick forging gloves she wore and stepped forward. What do they want? She said insistently, to talk alone, Quentin said grimly, then hefted the black cube glowing with purple runes. I'll find out what he wants, who he is, he said, then move towards the wall he had entered from once again. This could be dangerous, Dad. She tried to grab his arm. Quentin dodged her grasp easily. And I am a warrior of our great empire. I am here to protect. Protect you, protect the villagers, protect the empire. Our dead empire, she refuted. Stay inside, he repeated, pointing, and then walked to the wall. Step outside, I'll tan you on that leather rack. Young lady, your mud, she shook her head. Yeah, love you too, he said with angry sarcasm, then vanished into the wall. Hash. Gods, I'm turning paranoid. Argrave tapped his temple rapidly as they waited for Quentin's return. Keep thinking about ways this might go wrong. Can't muck this up. Gods? Repeated Gilliman, standing just behind Argrave. You always said God before. Argrave looked up perplexedly, then dismissed with a shake of his head. Whatever, been here months. When in Rome, Southron elven architecture was much more refined than most of the buildings they had seen in Sethia. Though Delphasium had been a place of marble, and was quite beautiful, this place had a distinct flavor and culture to it separating it from anything else. The walls were made of smooth, black sandstone, polished to the point where it shone. The glowing blue runes decorating the walls and ceiling gave an accent to the place that made it seem almost mystical. The chairs were made of silk and wood. The wood formed the frame and silk cloth stretched tight made the seat itself. It was a little like sitting in a hammock. The center sunk the lowest, while the edges held firm. Argrave's Brumasiners roamed at Argrave's feet, moving about the place frenetically. They were energetic little devils. He's coming, Glimmer notified Argrave, bringing him to attention. Soon after, Argrave heard the sound of steady footsteps coming up the stairs. When he saw the cube with glowing purple runes in the South Ron Elf's hand, Argrave straightened his back in the chair and placed his feet against the ground, ready to bolt. Don't freak, don't freak, it's just Quentin, he's just being cautious, caution, why else would he bring a grenade, Argrave tried to calm himself, feeling the ring beneath his gloves with a B-rank ward, and thinking of the enchanted leather armor around his skin, I'm glad you're willing to hear me out, Argrave said, trying to use conversation to ease his nervousness, mmm, grunted Quentin simply, grabbing a chair from another side of the room and pulling it until he sat across from Argrave and Gilliman. And what brings two Vaidimon to the last bastion of the Southron elves? Argrave tensed at once, 
Worried that Annalise had been discovered, he calmed and thought on the words further. Argrave touched at his ears, his hair had grown long enough to cover his ears, he realized. I'm human, actually, Argrave corrected, relieved. Just a freak of nature. I see, Conti nodded. He was being a little polite, a telltale sign he didn't trust them at all. I'm going to conjure a ward, Argrave said, holding his hands out. Block out listeners. Conti adjusted on his seat, placing the black cube on his armrest, clenched tight in hand. Go ahead. He gestured towards Argrave. Argrave went ahead, conjuring a C-rank ward to envelop the three of them. As soon as it was up, Conton questioned, How did Jebica die? Argrave scratched his brow, then said, Badly. Conton stared with his one remaining good eye. Argrave swallowed and continued, She was crushed, trapped. Removing the rubble would have killed her, and she'd been starving for some days when I found her, he described, going over the situation the player met her in game, tried to help. Maybe an S-rank spellcaster could have saved her. But I'm not one and not affluent enough to bring one. Conton ground his teeth together as he stared at Argrave, then he nodded. All right. And why are you here? Two reasons. Because Jebica came to trust me enough to divulge her tribe's secret. And because I need your help. Help? Conton frowned. And you sought it here? In a ghost town? Don't need your forces, not especially. What I want, is to uproot the vessels from Sethia, completely and utterly. My situation demands a third party. Your situation? Argrave licked his lips, choosing his words carefully. The Lord of Silver, Quarus has something that I want in his tower. The Lord of Copper is trying to use the Southern Tribals to wipe out Aurum and Argent before betraying the Tribals, absorbing all factions, Argrave disclosed, without qualms. I need what's inside, Argent, but I don't care to have the vessels being the only faction retaining power in the burnt desert. So, inform the Tribals of the betrayal, Conton suggested simply. I could, Argrave shook his head, but I want to be sure that the vessels in Sethia are purged. To do that, I've been working with the Lord of Copper. The Southern Tribals can't win against the vessels, the vessels have to fight amongst themselves. Conton took a deep breath and exhaled. So, you'll ensure they fight amongst themselves, while you wish us to be a proxy to inform the tribals? Precisely, Argrave nodded. You know as well as I do that without internal dissent, Sethia will never be free from vessel rule. Conton rotated the cube in his hand. Dot we will have to speak to the other warriors. They will be returning soon. Chapter 128 the old guardians. Conton sat in a group of near eight others, in the same house that he had just had his discussion with Argrave. The other Southron elves were grizzled, scarred warriors just as he was, obvious war veterans. They were in a loose circle, some standing, some sitting. So, just as Durin did, this new arrival claims to have met my daughter? One asked, a man with a missing nose. Yeah, Conton nodded, looking out towards the door. Same tale as Durin, too. Jebica was crushed beneath rocks. Same accounts, only difference. Conton turned his head back. Argrave brought Brumasoners with him. Seems to have tamed them, too. Their warriors all looked greatly intrigued by this. One, who leaned against Conton's wall, asked, How? I don't know. Conton shook his head. You didn't ask? The man pressed. What am I? A damned interrogator. You ask him. Conton crossed his arms and shook his head. What good are you, old bastard? The man with the missing nose asked. Least I can still smell things, Morven. Conton returned with a laugh. You go outside. That cavity you call a nose fills up with sand. What kind of desert warrior loses to sand? Some of the others joined the man in laughter. You an eyed brick. Morven leaned forward, a smile on his face. Let's stay serious. Another man interjected, though he seemed the oldest, he was the least scarred. All of the others heeded his words at once. Save the banter for when we don't have an unexpected visitor. This man, Argrave, claims to be working with the Lord of Copper. This deserves serious treatment. Conton raised his hands. Of course. Florimond. Florimond looked about. What is he doing right now? Someone stalked to the door of Quentin's house. Looks like he's letting the Brumasoners play with the children. That brief little description immediately made everyone stir. Either he's not a bad guy, or he's damned good at tugging the heartstrings. Morven shook his head. This is someone working for the vessels, another warrior posited, with the intent to betray them, too. Maybe he's a paragon. Maybe he's a good actor. That sobered some of the warriors up, and their smiles faded somewhat. But what he's saying, that the southern tribals are going to attack with the help of the Lord of Copper, it does match with what Diran told us. Everything matches, Kant conceded. Did you tell him anything about Diran? About the proposition the man's made to us? Florimond questioned. You think I'm stupid? Conton put a hand to his chest. I kept my mouth shut, tried to let him say his piece. Conton lowered his hand. And that warrior with him? Quiet fellow, Conton nodded, looked. I don't know. Probably the type of guy I'd avoid on the battlefield. Strong, tough hard. If a man like that would follow him, you'd run from anything, craven moron. Morven crossed his arms. You stand before that damned giant and tell me how brave you are. Conton gestured towards the no-nosed elf. His hand's bigger than your head. Maybe that's not saying much, considering how small the brain inside is. The whole room laughed, and even Morven sunk back into his chair, 
shaking his head with a grin on his face. So, what in the world are we going to say to this guy? Floramund looked around. Do we tell him about Diran? Why would we? Quentin crossed his arms. True, true. Floramund nodded. Nothing to gain from that. I do think we need to hear more from him, ask questions, work out his personality. And we need to hear this grand plan of his. Morvan raised his hand. Doesn't matter if he can manipulate the Lord of Copper if he's a drooling imbecile. If he's stupid, we should probably migrate. Been too long, anyhow. Don't like staying in this place for too long. We should regardless. But, Conton began, didn't want to say this, because it's just conjecture on my end. I brought this. He pulled out the black cube with glowing purple runes on it. He kept his eye on it, like he knew what it does. Jebica might have told him, Floriman posited. My daughter had never seen one of those, Morvan disagreed. Smart girl, but too young. He shook his head, then lowered his gaze to the ground. Too young, he repeated hollowly. The room grew quiet, as though to comfort the man's loss. Someone patted him on the shoulder, but no words were exchanged, they didn't seem needed. Yeah, embarrass me by staying quiet, Morvan finally broke the silence, shaking his head. Keep talking, you damned idiots. People in the room chuckled. Floramund heeded Morvan's advice, continuing, so, we ask him questions, try to get a clearer picture of things. Everyone in agreement? I said the entire room asynchronously. Hash. Sounds travel strangely in this place. I can hear nothing. Glamon shook his head. Their runes, Argrave explained. They help with privacy. Don't worry about it. Glamon stood beside Argrave, who sat on a rock in the oasis town. The Brumasinas dashed about the open area like little balls of lightning, the Southron elven children watching them and playing with them, tossing things to be retrieved or leading them about with feathers. Do you like children? Glamon questioned. No said Argrave immediately. Glamon looked down. You surprise me. Well, if they're related to me, it's fine, Argrave shrugged. I don't want to deal with other people's children, nephews, nieces, etc. That's tolerable. Otherwise, forget about it. Sons, daughters? He pressed. Argrave scoffed and shook his head. Wrong time to even consider considering that. You cannot control where the mind wanders, Glamon stated. I'm not ready. Argrave crossed his legs. End of discussion. I wasn't ready, either. He chuckled. Argrave looked up at him. He bit his lip, considering a question. Before he could ask it, he spotted a decent crowd moving towards them. The old warriors of the Southron elves moved from Quentin's home, striding towards them. Argrave stood, turning around. Despite their age, injuries. These men are full of vitality, Glamon stated. Are they skilled? Argrave questioned, though he knew the answer. I cannot tell a man's skill by sight alone. None can. Gilliman shook his head. But they're alive. That is testament to something. They're skilled, Argrave told Gilliman. Frighteningly so. Um, grunted Gilliman, keeping an eye on them as they moved closer. The crowd of old veterans was quite a gruesome sight. But strangely, Argrave could not bring himself to pity any of them. They seemed too proud to be pitied. Some were missing hands or had gruesome scars across their bodies. More than no nose was here, just as one eye Conton, the de facto leader, Florimond, was similarly present. Argrave felt a little nervous, facing them all. The Brumsiners either sensing his nervousness or simply tired of playing with the Southron elf children, rushed across the field and took refuge in his clothes. You must be our grave, Floramond greeted, and those creatures. He eyed one of the Brumasinas, who kept their golden eyes on the Southron elf suspiciously. Dot they are the last Brumasinas. That's right, our grave nodded, looking around the group, and his gaze stopped on Morvan. You must be Jebica's father. He stepped forward, swallowing. I'm sorry to be the bearer of bad news, but I know. Morvan held up his hand. He was missing a pinky. Conton told me. Argrave paused, taken aback by this reaction. At first, he dismissed the thought, presuming that the man had time to process his grief since Conton had informed him. But Morvan definitely wouldn't process it to this point, and especially not this fast. His breathing quickened as he came to a rapid conclusion. He's known. He's known for a while now. Argrave tried to think of alternatives, another explanation for this scenario. But nothing came and the only thing Argrave could conjure was that Morvan had been informed a long time ago. The Southron elf locked himself away for a week in Heroes of Berinder. Considering everyone else's personality had remained the same, there was no good reason Morvan's reaction to his daughter's death would change. Dot my condolences, Argrave managed to squeeze out, realizing he'd been silent for far too long. Your daughter was a woman of honor, thinking only of her people to the very last. Morvan nodded with a bitter smile, and then turned his head away. With more time, Argrave tried to think of how he could approach this. There had to be something he could say, some way he could spin this to get into contact with Darren. Hell, if he said the right things, his task might come a hell of a lot easier. Then his mind drifted back to the low way, where he had stacked up so many lies that it was difficult to keep track of them all. The unbloodied blade. The unsullied knife. Blaggard. All of that had come back to bite him. By chance. Argrave began. Am I not the first outsider to come here? If he was open and honest, he could expect the same in return, or at least, 
that was the gambit. The veterans acted like experienced poker players, none of them betraying their thoughts with their expressions. Argrave pressed the point, asking, have you met a man with a bore mask? Where's full plate armor, kind of like my friend here? The crowd stayed still. They're not reacting. A swing and a miss, Argrave concluded. Dot or a golden-eyed southern tribal by the name of Durin? That got something out of them. The way some moved, their eyes shifted. Argrave didn't need to have Annalise's empathic capabilities to tell that he had hit the head on the nail, though he'd feel a bit more confident if she was by his side, granted. Real erratic guy, kind of crazy, really cynical? Argrave followed, drawing more reactions from them to be sure that he was right in this assumption. Why are you asking? Asked Florimond. He had the best poker face of them all. He asked the question with enough confusion that even Argrave doubted if he was on the right track. Because he's the one that I need to inform Briam plans on betraying the tribals, Argrave said, nervous as all hell he was wrong about the whole thing. Silence settled in the clearing. The old warriors looked between themselves, silently communicating. After a long while, they nodded between themselves, before at last conveying that to Florimond. Florimond turned, facing Argrave, and finally confirmed, we've met Drun. Argrave felt like some pressure was released from his chest and he couldn't help but sigh. That's good. That's great. In fact, you're friends of his? Florimond gestured. We've never met. Argrave shook his head. But I know of him. And if he keeps on as he is, trying to work with Briam to take out the vessels in Sethia, he's going to get his whole damned tribe guild drained by the vessels. Argrave continued quickly, hoping they wouldn't ask the details of the relationship. Duran is a friend of the tribe, more than vouched for him. We can get your message to him. Then that's all that I need. Argrave clasped his hands together. Dot, but you're going to need to tell us a lot more about yourself, Florimond continued. Namely, your relationship with the vessels, your plans. Fine by me, Argrave nodded, sweating inwardly. This was going to be difficult to explain, to say the least, and Annalisa's magic couldn't last forever. I will say this. I advise you migrate your people. The Lord of Copper might have had eyes on me. I can't say for sure. He felt that exposing Yara's existence would only do more harm than good for further negotiations. Florimond nodded slowly. We'd planned on it. Anyways, been too long since we moved last. But come inside, let's talk. Chapter 129, Blades That Lie. Florimond held a pure white, likely genuine ivory, chisel in his right hand, a hammer in the left. He turned them about in his hand, inspecting them for any flaws or deficiencies. The other warriors looked over his shoulder, leaning atop him to see the thing better. They sat cross-legged on the floor in a rather strange place, a silk crafting room. Above, there were innumerable cocoons, each made of black silk. It made Argrave quite uncomfortable. But he hoped Gilliman, standing just behind him, would stop him from being hit by any dislodged bugs. There was a loom, too, and a female Southron elf attendant, who paid loose attention to the many warriors and two outsiders in her building. The conversation had gone passably, and Argrave had explained most of what he needed to the Southron elves. They had agreed to communicate with Darren, though nothing more and nothing less. That was what Argrave needed. The chisel and hammer were the items that Argrave had acquired in the Southron elf tomb. Though the Bramasoners had been the purpose of their visit then, in Heroes of Berinder, the reason the player went was to obtain those items. It was a fetch quest to earn the Southron Elves' trust. It wasn't entirely dissimilar to how Argrave was using them now, yet different enough Argrave had some doubt. Been near a century since I've seen a complete set of these, Florimond noted, and the other warriors in the room nodded, clearly impressed. Do you know what these are? He raised them up. They're the tools for your illusion magic, Argrave nodded. More than no nose crossed his arms. Don't call it magic, you damned palm tree. It's artisanship, the way of world bending. It's magic, Canton shook his head. Stop being a pretentious twat. Argrave might have been uneased by the band bandied about, but he felt it was actually a good sign coming from these people. If the South Ron Elves hated you, they acted polite. If they welcomed you, they always said what was on their mind, even if it was incredibly rude. Florimond handed the tools off to the other warriors, who eagerly took them from his hands and examined them. Why are you showing us these? I'm giving them to you. Argrave held his gaze. They all cast a glance at Argrave in that moment, surprise and suspicion bundled together. Argrave held his hand up. They're Jebikas, by right, she told me of the tomb. And I'm pretty certain she'd want to give it to you. Don't pull that noble nonsense, Kantin waved his hand. You can't use it. So you're giving it to us. Argrave laughed. Even if I could use it, I'd give it to you. Not because I'm some saint, but because I don't have a use for it. The people bristled at him when he said that, like he was contesting some point of pride of theirs. Argrave quickly added, they're largely stationary things, entryways, traps. I very rarely sleep in the same place twice. HMPH. Stationary. Florimond chuckled. You must never have seen our glay ives at work. Think I've hooked them. Argrave thought, but feigned ignorance. Shaking his head, warriors have a hard time of things. One of the veteran Southron elves spoke. A one-handed man named Yan. Compared to spellcasters like you. Vastly different trajectory. Mages start off piss weak. A militiaman with a spear could slaughter most mages up to D rank. 
the spells are slow, then, lacking power, lacking control. Argrave nodded, agreeing with this assessment. But mages, they don't have the same ceiling. Yan continued, there's only so much a warrior can do with his body alone. The spellcasters keep getting stronger and stronger, and before long, they leave the warriors in the dust. Of course, not everyone is cut out to be a spellcaster, else wise we'd still have a few more eyeballs and limbs, I suspect. None of us can cast a spell for shit, Floramund stood. At some point, we warriors have to look for other ways to handle things, ways to exceed the constraints of our bodies. Floramund walked to the corner of the room. Retrieving a glay eye, he turned back to Argrave and Gulliman. Does the big one care to have a spa? Gulliman placed his hand on the pommel of his great sword, adjusting his position. He looked down to Argrave, who gave him a nod of approval. My blade is enchanted, Gulliman tapped his sword. I'll have to use my axe. I'm too old for a real spa. Floraman shook his head. Don't listen to him, Morven interrupted. He's a damned force of nature. Floraman grinned, then shook his head. I'll use the blunt end of the glay eye. All you have to do is block or dodge a swing. Do it outside. The female loom worker chastised. Floramond cleared his throat, and then stepped outside. Everyone rose to their feet, following. Gulliman drew his axe and moved to stand opposite Floramond. The veteran Southron elf whirled the glay eye about before holding it in front of him. At the ready, if you've got enchanted weaponry, you've already realized the limits of your body. Floramond called out. Um, grunted Gulliman. Let's begin, Floramond said. He stepped forward. Swinging his glay eye towards Gilliman incredibly simply, Gilliman pivoted, holding the axe out to intercept it. Then, in a manner that made no visual sense at all, the back of Floramund's glay eye struck Gilliman in the neck. Gilliman twisted his body, moving with a blow, and stepped away. He stepped back, then raised his head, white brows furrowed in confusion. The old Southron elf smiled, while some of the veterans hooted and hollered. Floramund planted the bottom of the glay eye in the ground. You've got damned sharp instincts, quick reflexes. Had I been using the sharp side? I don't think my blow would have killed you. You'd be bleeding bad, though. Can guarantee you that. Gulliman rubbed at his neck. He stepped forward, holding his axe out. Again, he commanded. Floramond kicked the bottom of his glay eye, setting it spinning about in his hand. With a final flourish, he held it at attention. Once more, then, he said, moving forward with a snarl. The glay eye moved once more. The blow was not exceptionally fancy or fast, and Gulliman braced himself to receive it. Argrave paid special attention this time. The blade of the glay I've seemed to move with a will of its own, and Gilliman twisted the axe about, yet never caught it. Finally, it struck him squarely on the forehead. Ooh, Floramond winced. A bit worse this time. You get caught up in your own head, make a mistake. Seen it happen a thousand times before. Gilliman stared at Floramond, unoffended. He hefted the ebon ice axe in his hand, and then took a step back. Again, he repeated. The man loves to get beat. Quentin crossed his arms, one eye watching the spectacle. Floramond took his stance as serious as the first time. He stepped forward, swung, and Gilliman waited. He did not move his axe about wildly. Instead, he calmly moved to receive the blow. It didn't look like it would catch anything, but then, a ringing echoed out. The distortion settled, and the axe had met the glay eye. Gilliman locked the beard of his axe around the blade and pulled forward. Floramond was pulled forward briefly but released the glay eye. Gilliman advanced, then held his hand out and flicked Floramond in the forehead. The crowd erupted into cheers and laughter and Floramond stopped himself from falling by placing his hand against the ground. He rose to his feet, rubbing his forehead, then took the glay eye out of Gilliman's grasp. Once the uproar had settled, Floramond called out, I'm impressed. Yeah, you'd better be. Yan shouted, then broke off into laughter. It's the blade that's wrong. Had to follow the way your hand, your arm, your wrists moved, Gilliman noted, staring at the glay eye. That told me where the glay eye really was. Took Durin twenty tries to grasp that principle, and I thought he was fast at it. Floramond shook his head. Maybe it was a fluke. Maybe it wasn't. But you get the point I was making. No, this is what we achieve with the way of world bending. Floramond held the glay eye up into the air. Blades that lie. Arrows that should miss. Outcomes that shouldn't be. Argrave felt pride in his choice of companions. Hearing that Gilliman outperformed Drun. You didn't see the blade, either, Gilliman claimed. Very sharp, Floramond nodded. We have to learn our weapons extensively. The sensation of the weight, the resistance. We have to use that instead of our eyes. But back in the day, when our empire rode against the tribals, Bremerson is leaving a melody of war in our wake, each swing uncontested, our charge relentless. Nothing could stop us, Floramond lowered his head, reminiscing. And what brought you here? Gulliman pressed. What changed? Everything. Everything except us, Floramond shook his head. Not too late for you, Argrave suggested. Put aside your enmity, help Dren and his people wipe out the vessels. Hey, there's a time and a place, huh? Conton reprimanded. The kid isn't wrong. Yan shook his head. We can't afford to wage war. Floramond stepped forward, using the glay eye as a walking staff. There's maybe a hundred of us. We're all trained, all dangerous, but too few. Maybe I'm wrong. But Dren wants equipment, no? 
Argrave raised a brow. I'm sure you've told him the same thing you just told me. That's right. Floramond nodded. You're sharp, too, it seems. Though in a different way from that one, he pointed to Gilliman. I'll work something out with Duran. Settling a thousand-year grudge. Can't be done with an outsider as a mediator. He looked at Argrave deliberately. But I will tell you this. You wipe out the vessels from Sethia, as you claim. I can make your elven companions weapons like this clay I've. Here, the axe, the sword, the arrows. It matters not. Argrave raised a brow. You're serious? Yeah. Are you serious? Conton questioned. We're talking about our people's secrets, Floramond. Come off it, Morven interrupted. Maybe our knowledge will live on. Look at us here, before long, we won't have any choice but to inbreed. Populations thin, thins every year. Can't we see the writing on the wall? Floramond turned and half shouted. Let's not have this conversation here, now, he said pointedly, and that seemed to gather everyone's thoughts. Once everyone settled, Floramond directed his attention back to the two of them. For now. You may consider yourselves to be welcome among us. We will spread word of you to our people. Though I suspect everyone already knows of your presence. We will speak to Duran. I was hoping you could stand as the point of contact between the two of us. Argrave waved between them. Difficult for me to do so, in my position. Then we can do that. We will migrate, soon. Take the sword in the desert for us. When you leave, destroy it. That will sever the illusion magic. We will travel through the mountains, to Otrikshire. Do you know of it? I do. Argrave nodded, I'll return in some days. Then we will look forward to good news from you. Floraimond held out his hand. I am sure the others will wish to say their goodbyes. Come, won't you? Chapter 130, Dissatisfied Stalkers. Dot so, in time, I'll need to return to them to officiate things. The date of the attack, who they're collaborating with. So on and so forth, Argrave explained to Beam, sitting across from him. Yara stood behind him, hands behind her rigid back like she was a bodyguard. They had returned from the oasis town of the Southron Elves. It was very late in the evening, and Argrave was quite hungry. He had not eaten since morning. Business came before that, though. As Floramond had instructed, Argrave had broken the sword in the desert. The Southron Elves were soon to migrate, traveling through the mountains to another home of theirs. Annalise had ensured Yara did nothing out of place the whole while, and as far as Argrave could tell, no one suspected anything. The manifold uses of druidic magic were making themselves known already, though the Brumasoners were far from manifesting their full capabilities. Argrave needed to feed them souls, a strange need, truthfully, but considering the commonality of death, it was much better than your standard pet food. The Southron elves, Brim mused, it's a little unbelievable, but those illusion magics. No one else can replicate them, certainly, they've caused the vessels no end of trouble. How many were they? If you mean ready to fight? Near two hundred. Argrave exaggerated, attempting to bolster Brim's confidence, then. Excellent work, Brim leaned back into the chair. But it doesn't escape me that you used Yara to bolster your personal wealth. Those bets of yours, they're certainly more for you than for my cause. Well. One of the Brimasoners poked itself out of Argrave's clothes, and he pet its giant fairy ears. I'm no saint. Brim chuckled, it sounded fake. After, he raised his hand to his face. I think I've figured you out. Argrave furrowed his brows, thrown off. The Brimasinger, no longer being pet hid itself away once more. You're testing the limits. I don't think it's of any genuine concern. Presently, Brim held a hand out, reassuring Argrave. I'll warn you, though. A limit broken before a vessel will not result in merely a warning. Brim leaned in. It should not escape you that the punishment for any crime is death. Considering what I know, I also know that you're compelled to punish me. Not forced. Argrave returned. We're doing great work together, so far. Brim stared down Argrave running a hand across his coppery skin. Eventually he nodded. You've done well. The vessels have been looking for the Southron elves for centuries. Not a single success. Before you came along, only abandoned towns, ruined places. There has been little cause to hunt them in recent decades. Their mages are all dead and gone, and we seized and burned their books of spells. Nothing more remains of them to challenge Felhorn's authority. Any predictions on when Orym and Argent will make their move? Argrave probed. The gathering guards, the Lord of Copper answered idly at once, negating my influence in the city. Trying to stifle my income, my workers, vessels beneath me are being tempted with wealth, power. But the core of my power isn't in Sethia. I keep that which truly belongs to me in Cyprus. In here. But when? Argrave pressed. I don't want to be caught unprepared. A week, most likely too. Brim shook his head. You have time to do more before the fighting. Argrave tilted his head. Not planning on letting me closer into the machinations. Brim's gaze intensified at that moment as though challenged. What are you implying? Argrave shrugged. I just don't think that you're leaving things to chance with the tribals. Brim stared at him for a long while. I have to speak with Yara. Go, rest, he finally said, pointing towards the door. She'll rejoin you in time. For now, do nothing. Hash. Argrave stepped out of Cyprus a little relieved to be free of Yara, 
though he was not pleased to be carrying around his own backpack once again. Between the three furballs roaming about in his duster and the backpack, he was hauling quite a large load. Let's return to our room quickly. We have a little time to talk. Things are going well so far, Argrave commentated, walking quickly down the road. He felt the old sting of the scars in his lungs. He spotted someone ahead, wearing a set of baggy robes. They carried a large stick of sorts, the top of it wrapped it cloth. Argrave merely felt it was unusual, ready to pass it by. The person started to approach, though, and Gilliman grabbed Argrave. That's a weapon. Be cautious, he urged, stepping ahead of Argrave. Argrave kept his eye on the man. He questioned if they would simply pass him by, but the robed figure came to stand boldly before them. He didn't lower his hood, but as Argrave stared, he started to recognize the person. You're my saviors, is that right? remarked Duran. Argrave's breath caught in his chest at once. Duran had quite an eye-catching appearance. He had a golden tattoo just below his eye, acting like an extension of his golden pupils, and a handsome, confident face that practically screamed heartbreaker. His eyes had a certain wildness to them, and his grin never seemed to fade. The hell are you doing here? Argrave whispered, looking around frantically. No one was near, but that meant little, they were in the middle of a wide open road, and anyone could be watching. Well, I don't really like talking through third parties. I like to confront my admirers directly, Duran said staring unkeringly. His words confirmed that the Southron elves had already talked to him. It had been such a short time, and Argrave hadn't expected Durin to talk to him at all. The unexpected situation left him at a loss. You're tall. They were right, he nodded musingly. Yeah, great observation, hawk-like vision on you, Argrave whispered, eliciting a chuckle from Durin. Get the hell out of here. You maybe think there's a reason I went to a hell of a lot of effort to avoid talking to you directly? If Briam sees us talking. So you do know me, Durin noted. Pretty strange. I'm sure I'd remember meeting you. You had too much to drink that night. Dismissed Argrave. Forget this. Keep walking, Argrave directed his companions, and then moved towards the gate of Sethia. Jebica died when I last saw her. I was the last she spoke to, and I stumbled across her by pure chance. I'm pretty damn sure she'd mention any meeting with a weird-looking party like you three, Duran called out as they walked away. Argrave paused. Duran strode back up to him. Let's have a little date. Us four. He looked between them. And don't deny me. You've already given me a key to turn your lives upside down. I don't think Brim would react kindly to the correspondence between you and my elven friends. Probably kill you, too. Now that you've got some suspicion he's two-faced, Argrave called out his bluff. I think I could get away with it, Duran shrugged. Argrave stared down at him, questioning if the man he knew was crazy enough to do something like this. The worst part was that Argrave wasn't certain. You're paying for our meals. He eventually decided. Duran grinned. We'll see about that. Hash. Elias stared out into the distance, where the looming walls of Elbrail were not even visible in the all-consuming darkness. He and Stain sat in their carriage, moving through the night and towards the city. Their cavalry marched quietly towards the gates of the city, but there was a somber air throughout the whole party. The death of Bruno had affected more than simply Elias, he knew, but he needed to put on a brave front. You're sure about this, Stain? Elias questioned. Can't see more than a couple feet away. Maybe we should light things up. We have the... How many times do I have to repeat myself? Stain returned. The guy in this city, or girl, I suppose. No need for me to be like that. They're trying to manipulate the populace, stir them against Duke Maraud. If they wanted to do something against you, they want to do it in public. In daylight. But what if they don't? Elias insisted. This would be the perfect opportunity for them to strike. If they had the strength to strike, they wouldn't need to work out the people. The force inside can't be strong. We've got the strange purple-eyed one watching for attacks. You're safe, future brother-in-law. Stain crossed his legs. Trust me, this is the way to go. Why else did you bring me along, if not to get into the mindset of deplorable bastards? Elias ground his teeth. Not the way I'd phrase things. And that's why I'm needed. If you can't even think of saying nasty truths, you certainly can't predict the nastiness Vasca's going to truss at us. Stain shook his head. You deal with the noble pomp, I deal with the ignoble reality, kill a thing we've got going, here. What about once we're inside? Elias turned. I'm sure the Duke will welcome us, but once we're inside, what then? There's still someone trying to turn things against us. We won't be safe. We'll have to win back the people. Stain spread his hands out. I'm sure it had. Red-eyed you will have no problem with that. Give a speech. Talk about how honorable you are. Wave your banner around. Mention your father. The name of Parban has weight. The commoners will swoon at the mere sight of you. Elias swallowed, then moved back to the window. Just. Feeling pressured. This has to go right. Stain crossed his arms, saying nothing as the carriage moved steadily onwards. Inwardly, though. He was considering that the death of Bruno was a break for them, militarily speaking. Killing hostages was against all noble sensibilities, and the northern nobles would not be so steadfast in their support of Vasca. In turn, more southerners would be willing to support Parban. He kept it to himself, though. Another ignoble reality Stain had to deal with. Elsewhere in the city, in Dune sat, 
looking out through the window. Though he could not see the carriage moving by, his men had informed him that Elias, the son of Margrave Reinhardt, was moving into the city during the night. Enduin could not provoke the crowd, and as the news of Bruno's death spread to the people, support for Vasco would be lessened. Enduin prodded the tip of a white gold dagger against his finger. I planned to deliver this dagger back into the Margrave's heart, by hand, Enduin mused. Prove that I repay my debts. The royal knights behind said nothing, fearing to provoke anger by sticking their heads above the cloud. They knew well when their master was in a foul mood. I am thinking it would be even better if this dagger was returned to the Margrave in his son's coffin. I'd stab another heart. Metaphorically speaking, a heart may be even more vital to the Margrave than the physical one. Indune looked at the gleaming enchanted dagger, twisting it about in his hands. It appears I must struggle with the young lion. Indune set his dagger on the table. We'll carry out the plan tomorrow. The executions will continue as planned. I won't give the boy the chance to work anything out. I'll keep him trapped in the Duke's castle, whittling away at him until he's a nub, waiting for a mistake. As you command, Prince Indune, said the royal knight say synchronously. If you like this audiobook, Subscribe the channel for more videos like this. And join my Patreon if you want to support me, where you can find the complete collection Jekyll Among Snakes audiobooks. Hurry up, what are you waiting for? Leave some comment and let me know if you guys like this story, or you have a web novel you like and want to hear its audiobook. I will be happy to create them for you. Please like, share, and leave a comment on the video.